we got Rick Martell on the line. Let's get to uh, Rick Martell. Rick, how are you doing today? Good, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really good. Just for uh, the audience that doesn't know, Rick Martell wrestled uh, over 20 years, started as a teenager, wrestled all over the world, AWA World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, in the 80s, was uh, you know definitely considered one of the late 70s through the 80s, one of the top performers in the business, big stars, the model in the WWF. Made a comeback a couple of years back with WCW. And now um, you're wrestling on occasion still? No, I've been wrestled uh, since uh, last year. I, um, you know, I call it quits. So, so it's full-time quits. Cause, cause oh, yes. wrestling <laughs> Retired uh, fully. Because <laughs> in wrestling, <laughs> you know how retirements are in wrestling. Yes, uh, yes, it's uh, weird to say, but uh, but this time, uh, you know, I mean it, um, especially after, um, you know, my injuries I uh, I had in uh, with WCW, and uh, I said, well, it's, you know, I should uh, really do it this time. Was there, was, there, was, there, was there a situation, was it a match with Stevie Ray where you got hurt, where it was just kind of like you made, did you, because you, you had, you had been off for a couple of years, you came back in tremendous condition, yes. and I think you hurt your knee, but then you came back and got hurt again, is that kind of how it went down? Yeah, that, that was my first match uh, after my injury, uh, and of course I had the injury after a match uh, against Booker T uh, in San Francisco, and um, so I had four months of therapy. Uh, physiotherapy on my knee, uh, everything was great. I came back, I got back into really good shape. And my first match in Las Vegas against Stevie Ray, he uh, he wanted to give me a finish, you know, that uh, uh, with the flapjack. And uh, as you know, uh, you know, you have to put your knees down uh, at the same time on your neck, you know, to, so the fall is not all all on your neck. And the last second before I hit the mat, I kind of got a gun shy. I, I lifted my knee that was injured, and all the weight went on my neck. And uh, I had like two vertebrae out of place, you know, for a couple of days. So, so I, right there and then, I decided to call it quits. Okay. What during that period, like uh, how, how long and uh, what was your training like, and and what what prompted you to make the the comeback with WCW, and what what prompted you to leave wrestling for the couple of years before that? Well, I I didn't finish it the way I really wanted it to finish it. Uh, you know, in my last two years, uh, see what happened, Dave. I got involved with uh, real estate. Uh, uh, you know, commercial real estate, you know, a lot, and and it took a lot of my time, and so uh, in the last two years with WBF, I didn't finish it the way I wanted it, you know, and uh, so I want to make a comeback uh, uh, to make a really good, uh, you know, to finish it the way I want, you know, and I, I want to get back in really good shape the way I, I like it, and uh, so I... Um, I, I took uh, a couple of years off my business, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to go back to wrestling and just concentrate on wrestling 100% and training and dieting and everything, you know. And I made a comeback, and I'll tell you, I'm glad I did because I uh, I really enjoyed, um, you know, uh, working for WCW, uh, you know. I liked uh, the way they treated me, even when I was injured. You know, the treatment was first class. Uh, I never had to worry about nothing, you know, about anything, about payoff. About, you know, the treatment was really good. Is there, um, if you look back at, at your career, uh, what would you say now, looking back, would be your high point? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, in Minneapolis, uh, when I uh, defeated uh, Jumbo Chiruta, which, uh, by the way, I'm very, very sorry to hear his death uh, last week. Uh, uh, you know, when I defeated him for the AWA uh, title in uh, Minneapolis, uh, it was definitely the high point of my career. Now, at that at that point in time, um, right at the time you got that AWA title, you pretty much were being pursued fairly heavily by WWF, and you kind of got the AWA title, so you decided not to go. And then, right, right. is that kind of, is that kind of how it went down? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly how it went down. Uh, you know, uh, I was talking with, uh, you know, Vince about making a comeback uh, to WAF, and then I got a call, you know, uh, from Vern, and, you know, I wanted to and Bob go on and discuss it, and uh, so that's how it went down, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, as far as, like, uh, as far as, like, going to Japan and stuff, do you have good experiences there, or so-so? What was what's your thoughts about those trips? Oh, great experience. Uh, in fact, uh, right after I won the belt, uh, you know, in Minneapolis, uh, uh, two months later, that was my first trip in Japan as a world champion. 
um, I just got married and I brought my wife with me when they're on a honeymoon, uh, you know, makes uh, pleasure in business. And uh, and they were great. Uh, Barbara's, uh, you know, they, they were fantastic with me. Uh, they really give me the first class treatment there, you know, and and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had a good experience as far as business also with them, you know, uh, great people to work with and uh, and in and out of the ring, you know. Uh, let's go to uh, hey, we'll, get, we'll go we'll go to a call break before this break. Um, let's okay. start with a uh, Todd in Maryland. Todd, you're first up with myself and with Rick Martell and Brian. Hey Dave, hey Rick, hey, uh, hey Brian, how's everyone doing? Uh, good. Hey uh, Rick and Brian, can you hear him? Hey, I hardly I'll, can I'll hear him. But actually, I was going to address this more to more to Dave. But I mean, it's a general question because I sort of wanted to address the racial issue in WCW, the racial discrimination suit, um, mm-hmm. because I sort of I. I wanted to call last week, but I didn't end up getting a chance. And I feel like it's sort of being addressed a little bit off the subject of it because it seems like the discrimination is viewed more in a passive light rather than an act, uh, more in an active light rather than a passive light. And I, I feel like a lot of the discrimination is sort of inherent in, in wrestling and in WCW. And a lot of the time it's, it's justified just by the way it is. You know, Russo didn't intend to discriminate against people or WCW didn't intend to discriminate against people, but I think that the problem still exists, whether it's being, you know, attacked one way or another. I mean, I look at Russo's comment, you know, I want to see Americans, you know, on my American show. And it seems to me sort of parallel to if, you know, some sort of governor were to say, I am going to aim to my white audience because they're the people with the money and they're the most people. It makes sense in a business perspective, and but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right or that it isn't discriminatory. Um... If you could just give your thoughts, I have more to say on the subject, but if you want to just, you know, fire back your thoughts on that. I don't know. Um, I mean, we talked about it at length. I mean, there's, there's certainly something there. I don't know how overt it is, and it's a real, it's, it's such a, it's a touchy issue. I mean, like, you know, there, there are very, very talented wrestlers that are not American and Canadian that have not gotten a fair shake because of the belief if they're not they can't get over and it's it's like chicken and the egg thing in wrestling like this everyone in wrestling i think um you can come to and point faults and and pick apart points and say this is why this guy can't get over okay and if the bookers believe that this is why this guy can't get over you know they, they're not going to get over yeah. and and other guys you know sometimes they'll they'll look at a guy i mean helmsley's like the perfect example they looked at hunter Hearst helmsley and go this guy can get over. He's tall. He's got a good body. He's got you know great hair, and uh, you know he's he's a good worker. But it took him forever to get over. But he got chance after chance after chance. And you know obviously he's he's earned his stripes now. You know he's a big draw. He's one of the biggest draws in the business. But very few people got as many chances as he did to get that. And it was because of you know they said he's got you know Luger. Luger's another example. It's like a guy who you know nobody ever got as many chances as Luger. You know what I mean? Because somebody looked at, everyone looked at him and go, we can make money with this guy. And, and whether people did or didn't in the law, in the end, there were plenty of guys who, you know, never got that opportunity. I, I think know with it's Russo, just... it's not a race issue, but it's more an issue of the kind of wrestling that he liked as a kid or as he was growing up, and they just weren't the luchadors. But, see, and those are very good points, but the difference, I think, at least in my mind, the key distinction is that when you're talking about a guy who's maybe short, who doesn't fit into his, you know, his idea of what a wrestler's supposed to be, a lot of those people haven't been historically discriminated against, which is a lot of the basis behind their racial discrimination, too. In other words, you know, a guy who's necessarily short, he hasn't, you know, like a Latino or a black person in American society, hasn't had, you know, this discrimination over a long period of time that's, you know, going against his ability to make money over long periods of time. Whereas, you know, you can say a certain guy has a certain view um, in wrestling. It doesn't necessarily mean that the same thing can be applied to a guy who is going to be viewed that way by a lot of society. In other words, like, I think, you know, when Harlem Heat first came in, when they gave them that, that gimmick with the chain, you know, I don't see how um, that is so much their view of what wrestling should be, but so much their view of what society is. And that societal view is a lot more dangerous than just uh, not letting a guy get over because they view that wrestling isn't that important and they need a certain charisma or they need long hair or they need something of that ability. Uh, you know, that, 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 that chain thing in the 90s, let me tell you something, that chain thing in the 90s was so many decades outdated that it was really sad 
that 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 anyone in wrestling would actually think that that was what society would would would, would push the right buttons in society at that point in time. You know, I mean, it's like, jeez, I mean, you know, look at Magic Johnson, and Michael Jordan, they were already around then, and it's like that's, you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they were marketable to, to every aspect of culture, and you know, here we're in this business trying to put these guys in chains to get heat. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's kind of sad about this business. Yeah, and, and it, it just, you know, it shows how large the problem is. And I think wrestling has is, is been attacked in a lot of ways, but that's one way that it really hasn't been attacked in terms of its categorization. And I think that while the issue with Sonny Ono and some of the other people, it may seem that it isn't attacking the right thing. You know, like a Juventud Guerrera, it's obvious that this guy, if marketed right, could have been a huge star, or Rey Mysterio Jr., but if you look at a guy who's, you know, borderline like Sonny Ono, I think that if you show in a certain way that they're, that they're discriminating inherently just by an idea of what a certain minority is supposed to be in wrestling, that it doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, the sort of the, the parallel that, that draws in my mind is if a lot of people attack affirmative action because it, uh, because it addresses mainly upper-class white women or middle-class white women. But that doesn't mean that middle-class white women aren't inherently discriminated against in, in comparison to middle-class white men. In other words, uh, Sonny Ono may not be a manager on the caliber of a James Cornette, but if he's compared to, say, a Jimmy Hart at this stage who gets no heat himself, that maybe he's being treated in a different way on a, on a lower scale, but it doesn't mean it isn't necessarily discrimination in one form or another. And uh, Brian's got to go because he's going to a Tacoma. We've got uh, Rick Martell here. Brian, um, you're going to be uh, so you're gonna be at the show tonight. Yep, I'll be at the SmackDown tapings, and uh, hopefully I'll put up a report sometime late tonight on the website, so you guys can make sure to check that out. Okay, that's tremendous, and uh, Brian will be here tomorrow at 6. And uh, anyway, okay, we'll talk to you tomorrow then, Brian. Sounds good. Okay, great. We've got uh, Rick Martell here as well as a full bank of phone calls. Let's go to Richard in Canada. You're next up with Rick. Uh, hi, how are you guys doing today? Good, thanks. Oh, uh, that's good. Uh, first off, a uh, question for Rick Martell. I was wondering, uh, what's your favorite match in, of all time in your career, and who is your favorite person to work against? Well, I think there's a, you know, it's hard because there's several for different reasons, uh, several guys uh, that I enjoyed working with, you know, for different reasons. Uh, first of all, for I really, uh, off the top, you know, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, working with Tito. You know, very, uh, I really enjoyed that, you know, hard, you know, he's a hard worker and um, always wanted to to give it all, you know, and I enjoyed that. I liked that. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, Nick Barquinkle had some really good matches with him. I really enjoyed it. Stan Hansen, you know, always uh, worked hard and, uh you know, those are the guys that stick in my mind right now. And uh, as far as my favorite match, uh, I'd have to say it was against Nick Bonquinko when I wrestled him. Well, there's two matches that stick in my mind. Uh, and it's funny, those are two one-hour matches. Uh, the one in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1978 against, uh, 1978 against Nick Bonquinko, uh at the uh, Blaisdell Center in Honolulu. Uh, was one of my favorite match, and uh, also in 1984 uh, against uh, Ric Flair in Tokyo, uh, you know, uh, really enjoyed that match. Okay, that, uh, was, <laughs> that, that was going to be a trivia question for later in the show. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. No, 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 no. I just it was the I was gonna ask a question of where where the the Rick Martel uh, Rick Flair AWA NWA unification match, which went um, I don't know, about forty minutes to a double count, I think. Yeah, right. Uh, as I recall, uh, which was a, which was it was a super match. Um, when um, where where that match took place. But anyway, gotta come up with another. One. Anyway, go ahead, Richard. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, isn't it you know funny to see and you know how in the WWF where they're giving people time to to develop uh, that Chris Benoit's interview last night developed more so and he's developed more so in a couple months there on interviews than he has in WC than he did in WCW in the time because his interview last night was pretty darn good it's you know and the same with Edge and Christian they're starting to cut some wonderful promos now and I, you know, I just don't see WCW giving the time for people to develop slowly and improve their interview quality to produce entertaining stuff. They're trying. 
I mean, if you watch their TV, they're trying to give the young guys, you know, Vampiro and Kidman get a lot of interview time, you know, so they're, 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 it's, they're trying, you know. It's, but the, the it's problem hard. with what they're trying is, is they're just throwing them out there to dry, you know, out there without any backup. You know, I don't think they're getting, you know, Arn Anderson to, you know, take these people aside and tell them, you know, here's how you cut a proper promo. You know, the WWF seems to be backing these guys up, you know, wait, waiting until they're perfectly developed to get on the mic so they don't make a fool out of themselves. Well, they, they, they give them, um, they seem to give them a lot more structure. I know, what would, Rick, what, what would you, you know, because you, you work for both companies. I mean, what, how would you compare as far as, like, that aspect of preparedness and stuff? Of course, there's different eras and everything than now, but still, like, uh, working for WWF, working for WCW. In that, yeah, well, in Without, a, without any doubt, uh, I believe uh, WBF, as far as uh, developing talent, you know, uh, Vince, uh, you got to give that to him. He, he knows uh, how to get the maximum out of each guy, you know, and, and make things happen. Uh, he has a flair for this. He has a, a knack for that. You know, he knows how, and uh, they, they spend more time also on, on, uh, on, that, on that aspect, on, on taking a character, making it better, and, and how to make it, how to make things happen for that character, as opposed where uh, WCW, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, uh, don't you know they they're so busy with other stuff that they don't really pay attention to that very 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 important aspect. Anything else, Richard? Uh, no, that's uh, enough. Uh, have a good uh, evening and hope Brian enjoys SmackDown tonight. Yeah, I'm, I hope so too. <laughs> uh, let's go to uh, John in Chicago. John, you're next up with Rick Martell. Hey, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, I loved uh, I loved you when uh, you were with the Can Am Can Am Express uh, Can Am Connection. Yeah. And also the uh, Strike Force was actually was actually my uh, favorite tag team. Oh, well, thank you. Um, uh, I want to ask you um, if I remember correctly, one of your last matches was against Booker T, right? My last match was against Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray, but right. but didn't you also have you were fighting um, with Booker T for the TV title? At the right, that, that was uh, the. It's funny, my last two matches ever in professional wrestling was uh, against Booker T, and then my last one was against Stevie Ray. <laughs> right, right. I, I was wondering what what is your opinion of Booker T because here he's a guy that always seems. He he has the moves. He I, I feel he has that that pers personality. Maybe he he doesn't have the interview skills as yet, but he he could be one of the top superstars in this business. But for one reason or another, WCW doesn't seem to recognize that or put him in a correct situation where he can um, blossom. You know. Yeah, well, you know, you, you, you gotta admit that WCW, they, well, I was there anyway, you know, last few months, I don't know what happens, uh, what's happening there, but la when I, while I was there, I know, you know, they, they give, uh, you know, Booker T a decent push, you know, they, they put the strap on him for a long time, and, and, uh, you know, they, uh, and I agree with you that Booker T has got tremendous potential, he, you know, he's got, he looks great, uh, he's got some great moves, and, uh, and, the, all he needs is a decent push, you know, like you say. Right. It just seems like, like um, for, for me, it was like uh, there there comes a point where a certain wrestler will not, at WCW, like Chris Jericho, like a Booker T, will only they'll hit a glass ceiling, either yeah. because well, of their size comes, or their skills or something, you know. Yeah, it comes back to what I was saying earlier about. Uh, you know, making things happen for each guy or, you know, the character, uh, you know, where WF, they somehow, they just have the, the recipe, you know, they, they just know how to make things happen uh, for some reason, where WCW has a hard time doing that. Right, right. Um, two quick questions for you, Dave. I was wondering. Um, I was wondering, did, uh, first question is, did you happen to uh, hear or catch a... Uh, a review of Russo's remarks uh, last night after the Nitro? No. Just tell me about him. Um, but, well, one of the remarks was he was saying how the WWF can, you know, they only have two people they can put the title on, and he can put the title, uh, the WCW title on to anybody. And so? I was so? just wondering, <laughs> is, I think, does that mean, like, the garbage man in the street, you know, uh, if they're going to put it on Arquette and everything? 
everybody. And it just seems like he's just not, you know, it doesn't matter if you can put the title on, like, 20 different people. It yeah, matters to... if the title is worth something, if, if that person you're putting at it on is a good torchbearer. Exactly. It, it, I mean, I mean it, you, you could put the title on anyone, but it's got to be effective. Unfortunately, with WCW, and everyone knows this, is, is that the only guy the title is effective on, and I don't know why, I mean, I sort of know why it isn't, it's because he's got the experience, but it's the wrong guy now, but it's the most effective guy is Flair. Yeah. Whenever Flair has it, it actually somehow or other seems to mean something. I don't know if it's his, the way he, the way he carries himself on TV, but, yeah. I mean, the reality is, is Rick's 51 years old, and he shouldn't be the focal point of the company, but he is the best one in that spot. And they um, totally destroyed Jeff Jarrett now, because he's just now a total gimmick wrestler. He does. It does not seem. I mean, whenever he's battling for that title, there's always something goofy that's going to happen. That you know, that he's going to win it by that. The blood falling from the ceiling. Uh, David Arquette, you know, uh, turning on DDP. You know, he's not winning. He's not doing anything. You know, to on his own almost. You know. Well, that's just the way that that's just the way that that heel is booked in yeah. this day and age. I mean, I think that's. You know you can't you can't blame that on on him, but um, I mean the, the thing is 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 I, I don't know it's like I I, some, I I don't see the lot the logic in in so much of what Russo has been saying because right. it's like if, if uh, just as an example if, if we go into the the mid 1970s uh, it just doesn't even matter the era any era there there probably have been times even the mid 1980s okay realistically. Hulk Hogan held that title for years and years and years and years and years. And probably, uh, with the exception of Savage, I mean, there were, there were maybe two or three guys who probably could have held it at that level. Right. But when you, but when you got one, and you don't need to go to those other ones. And, yeah. and you know, he could have, hey, he could have, he could have took, take the title off of Hogan in the 80s every other week. And I mean, it's not like it would have killed the company, but it probably would have made the title mean a whole lot less if they were changing it every week rather than, you know, changing it. When, when every title changes something that people remember, you know, 10 years from now. I mean, let's face it, every wrestling fan who was a fan in the 80s probably remembers, you know, Hogan beat the Iron Sheik and right. then, you know, where he lost it with the match with Andre the Giant and then the Savage got it and all that, that, that lineage. And I don't think that anyone know, can, can recite the lineage of WCW's title from January to now. No. With, with, you know, fully. You know, who could? It's been like, what, 13, 14 changes already this year. Yeah. Um, one, real, one last real qu uh, quick question for you, Dave. Um, this just came up in my mind because I was uh, I, I had heard the radicals on a on a different show uh, talking about uh, their uh, the, the event at Dallas um, when they came, when they first turned on uh, against Mick Foley uh, on Raw that Raw, Raw that day and I was yeah. wondering I wanted to ask you uh, because to me those that two hour Raw was probably the best. Um, American wrestling event so far this year, as far as for the, for the big three, because it had all, you know, plot turn, good story, good wrestling in there, almost every, ma almost every match clicked. And I was wondering, um, for you, for the big three, what, um, what, uh, what event, um, in the first, first half of the year, um, was, uh, was the, the best to you? <sighs> That's hard. I really liked the Backlash pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. I really liked the uh, No Way Out paper. No Way Out. That's the one with the Hell in the Cell match. Right. Yeah. I really liked that. I I really liked that match. As far as there was a certain thing that gripped me in that match, and, and maybe it wasn't even good because really the Royal Rumble to me was a better match. Mm -hmm. I like Royal Rumble a lot, you know, because the, the main events were were tremendous on the show. Yeah. The No Way Out. There was something about. It. I think that it was kind of scary because I'm. I watched No Way Out with this idea that. Please, I don't want. It was a different emotion. It was like, please don't kill yourself in your last match. You right, know what I mean? Right, it's like, exactly. don't take, don't take a, don't take a bump that's going to kill yourself. So I was watching it from. It was a very different way of watching a match than I probably ever watched a match. But it was, it was the most gripping match I saw all year. Oh yeah, because they totally played against that fear, you know. Because we had remember seeing Foley, you know, jump, you know, uh, doing the first leap and everything, you know, being thrown off the first cage and going through there. So they played against that. You know, when is he going to jump houses? And then they did it at the most uh, unexpected time. You know, so it was it was a great it was a great book match. You know. Okay, John. Uh, John, we got to head out of here. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Okay, um, Rick. Real quick, how much how much of the, the the current wrestling? I mean, how how much wrestling do you watch these days? Um, 
None. Oh, really? I haven't watched any wrestling for the last uh, eight months. Uh -huh. Is there any any reason? Is it something with the product, or just are you too busy, or was there any you know? Uh, a little of uh, everything, I guess. I don't know. It's just maybe I don't know. I just uh, you know, uh, it's been you know when I watch it, I ha I just have uh, this feeling of uh, you know <laughs> wanted to you know I'm involved in it too much, or so I just I just wanted to cut it. You know, and just said, well, I'm just going to move on to something else. And for right now, I just want to put a little distance between wrestling and myself, you know. Was was it when you were in it? Did you, because a lot of people sense that it's, 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 it's very addictive. You know, because, like, you know, you know how, like, so many of the guys, they can't retire even when it's, even when they, when they want to and they, it's probably in their best interest. Yeah. It's, 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 it, it, well, I want to, we'll, we'll touch on this when we come back, but, um, I think about this. It, it is a hard business to walk away from, and that's why I'm kind of impressed that you, can say that and say I don't watch it, and I and when I asked you if you retired, I mean it was like you didn't say like well you know I could come back for one more run in a couple no. of months if I want to. I mean it was just like no I'm retired. Yeah, Dave, I'm definitely retired, and that you can put that on record. You know, I mean I had many uh, offers to come back, uh, you know, and uh, and that's why I don't want to watch it uh, because uh, you know I had some good offers to come back, you know, and. And I, I just don't want to. I, I don't want to get involved with it anymore. I'm, I'm successful in my business and uh, doing great. And, and uh, you know, wrestling, I had a great career. Uh, things were great. And, and my last match, I, 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 I walked in there in great shape, and I walked out in good shape. So I, I just want to leave it like that, you know. You were, you were still a teenager, or were you just like at 20 years old when you first like hit it pretty big in New Zealand, Australia? Whoa. Yeah, I was it's 20 like... years old uh, when I was in uh, New Zealand, yeah, in Australia. Um, what what led to that? I mean, you broke in. What were you about sixteen when you broke in, right? Uh, I was just turned seventeen. Yeah. Just turned seventeen. And yeah, in Nova Scotia. And uh, what happened is, uh, you know, some uh, some guy got hurt, and they needed a replacement within forty or twenty four hours. And uh, so my brother called me. He says, you know, get on the plane, and uh, you know, you start wrestling right now. You know, and I said, oh man, I, he says, get on it. You know, he told those guys I had experience with, I didn't, and I went there, and uh, the more really liked me, Rudy K. Uh, and then I, you know, he took me as his protege, and uh, you know, was going to the ring with me, and finally things got up on a great start and so it was uh, during my summer vacation then I went back I was supposed to go back to school and Dave I went in one day and then I, the next day the next morning I got up went to see the principal uh, you know I said this is it I said what after one day so you finish so yes I know I'm not going to finish my year so I want to go back to wrestling right now I don't want to waste my time and I, I went out I went back to wrestling and I never regretted it so you don't regret that at all. Now, no. what what led what led to you going? Because um, I think the first, I think the maybe the first time I actually ever saw you wrestle, which was weird. It was a uh, Harley Race was coming to San Francisco, and they showed a promo tape because Harley Race was the world champion, and it was a match from and I don't know if it was Australia or New Zealand, but it was a TV match that he had with you, um, and so this this had to be seventies, right? Yeah, and you know the, the funny thing about it is that. You know, I wasn't supposed to wrestle Harley that night, you know, that day in in, uh, in Australia. Uh, you know, I was uh, leaving Australia to go to New Zealand, and we were just taping the last, uh, my last TV match, the last uh, TV day, you know. So all of a sudden, I'm supposed to wrestle, you know, in a tag match, and uh, then they, they changed it for some reason. They said, oh, uh, Rick, you know, we'd like for you to work with Harley, you know, and uh I said, well, okay, great, you know, I enjoyed, you know, always enjoyed working with Harley, you know. So, uh, yeah, no problem, you know, so uh, finally uh, I wrestled with Harley, and, you know, of course, uh, he went over, you know, and uh, uh, so I went to New Zealand, uh, you know, it was no big deal, and uh, now all of a sudden I remember Bruiser Brody was, was wrestling then uh, Australia and New Zealand, he was doing both places. Then he comes back to New Zealand one day, so he took me aside and said, Rick says, you're going to be hot. He says, you know, he says, Harley sent for that tape. You're going to show it all over the States, you know. I said, oh, man, you know, me doing a job, you know, at Harley, you know. And, oh, man, you know, because I, I didn't want, you know, I wanted to stay away from the States uh, as long as possible because I didn't want to, I wanted to come back and, you know, do a, a good start, you know, make a good start, make things happen, you know. And now uh, here I am doing a job Harley everywhere, you know. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and uh, you know what? And that thing turned out to be the best thing for me because, you know, I don't know what happened, but I got calls from all the promoters, you know, wanting me to go to their territory, you know, back then, you know. Uh, you know, it was a pretty good match, and, uh, you know, I don't know if it was the Australian flavor to it or what, but they wanted, you know, it really did not good for me. Now, um, did you go to, was your first territory in the States Georgia, or did you wrestle before Georgia in the States? Yeah, Florida was my first place. Uh, Kevin okay. Sullivan uh, was instrumental in getting me in the States. Uh, you know, I was wrestling in Calgary, and a lot of guys, you know, from the States used to go, oh, Rick, you should go to the States, you'd be doing great. And, and all of a sudden, you know, Kevin came to me and said, oh, Rick, you should go to the States. I said, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. You know? And then he said, look, I'm, gonna, I'm really good with the gram, you know, I'm going to help you out. Okay. And then finally he followed up on it, and uh, thanks to Kevin, you know, I got my stars in the state. And, in fact, I just thanked him, <laughs> you know, when I went to WCW. I hadn't seen him for several years, and I thanked him for that, you know. Let's go to Dave in Cincinnati. Dave, you're next up. What's going on? How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing good. Yeah, it was good to see you the other day. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, was, I was also going to point out, uh, Jeff Jarrett uh, me, is going to be breaking some records. He may be <laughs> yeah, up. I'm sure he will at this race. Yeah, but, two records, actually. Uh, six, uh, 15-time world champion record. And, uh, oh, a- absolutely. And he may be uh, beating Lex Luger's uh, record for most chances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I read like a recap. Like uh, Vince Russo's comment was like that you can put the WCW title on Ric Flair, Jeff Jarrett, Scott Steiner, Goldberg, but the only people you can put the WF title on is The Rock and uh, Triple H. But my, and he said he said you can't put it on Jericho or Kurt Angle. But my my response to that is if Chris Jericho were to ever walk into a, on a, or ever to appear on a WCW Nitro, he'd probably get the biggest pop of the night. Oh, now? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Rick, uh, what, I wanted, what I wanted to ask is, um, I remember in the 80s, uh, I certainly enjoyed the NWA wrestling better, but like I was, for some reason, I was like, as a kid back then, I was a lot more drawn to the WWF characters, and plus the lighting and the production were way ahead of the NWA. But I remember, I remember reading some interview like a few years ago, you said that like that breakup with Strike Force was a shoot. Like you said that you walked out, like that you like purposely walked out on Tito, Tito Santana at uh, WrestleMania Five. What was that about? Well, uh, see, I uh, I was babyface, you know, and uh, I wanted to switch heel, you know, and Vince and Pat uh, Patterson didn't agree with me, you know. Nobody did, you know. Nobody said, oh, no, you're not going to be, you know, a heel. Or, you know, people like you too much, and you don't have the face for it. You don't have the attitude, and. You know, and me, I, I knew I could, you know, and I knew I wanted it, and they didn't, you know. And uh, so I, um, you know, uh, I went, I quit, you know, I quit uh, for Vince. I said, well, if you don't want me, if you want to do it with me, then I'm going to do it elsewhere, you know. And I walked out. So, uh, you know, they said, uh, finally, uh, you know, I worked out a TV in Tampa, and uh, finally uh, he called me back and said, look, Rick, uh, you know, come back, we'll discuss about the, you know, we'll talk about it. And, you know, nobody believed I could make it here, you know. <laughs> so uh, so that's how it happened. That's how we made it happen. Yeah, I remember, like, yeah, I was a huge fan at the time. I remember I was, like, a big Strike Force fan. I, I was just so mad that uh, when they broke up. I also remember, didn't you go, like, 60 minutes at a Royal Rumble? Like, one Yeah, uh, it was 54 minutes or, or 56, I can't remember, around that, you know, and, uh, uh, in Miami, yeah. Yeah, like I remember, like even at the end of your WWF career, I, you you were still uh, wrestling just some awesome matches. Like I remember, like some like Battle Royal with Razor Ramon for the Intercontinental Title. That was a that was a pretty good match. Yeah, you know uh, Razor, I, um, you know uh, Scott Hall. I always rem- I always enjoyed uh, working with him. You know, great talent, and uh, I always wanted to make uh, you know a good match. I always wanted to work hard and uh, enjoy them. Uh, Dave, mm-hmm. I remember you you got some email like a couple of weeks ago asking me the best Raw match ever. What do you think yeah. of that retirement match between Kurt Henning and uh, Ric Flair? I thought I remember that was. That was... Good. It was very good. I, I wouldn't rate it as the best one ever, though. I mean, in my in my in my mind, I mean, I remember. Um, I'm, I mean, I remember Reno was really really good. You know, I, I mean, maybe with Flair, the deal is is that you know he had so many great matches that the ones that always stick out to me were like you know Steamboat and Barry Wyndham. Speaking and, of Steamboat, did you see that tape? 
Um, I have not watched the whole tape, no. But I mean, I've, I've watched probably most of those matches at some point in my life that you, you know he gave me. Uh, yeah, like yeah, like, when, yeah, that's a match that I really don't hear about. Is that Wyndham against Flair match? I saw that match and. Which, which 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 one? The Battle of the Belts or a different one? It was there, there were two matches they had in uh, 1987 that were probably like two of the best matches that I've ever seen. They had the one from the one from Fayetteville, and they had one in Orlando. I, if those are the two you were referring to. There was also to. a match between Flair against Jumbo Saruta. That was a really awesome match. I've seen I've seen a well, Flair and Jumbo Saruta wrestled many times, but there was um they had a 60 minute match, and Japan. they had the match that then they had the match that Flair won. You know, with a, I think it was like a ref bump type finish. It was kind of an American finish. So, which, which, do you know which one you're talking about? Uh, I just, I think it was like in 1984. It was like in, it was in Japan. That might have been a different one, because because the because the 83 one was they did the 60 minute match. Um, I mean, they probably wrestled again afterwards. And um, and, I, mean, and I remember a match against Brian Pillman uh, that he had that was just uh, really awesome. It was I think it was in 1990. It was on the, WCW uh, Saturday Night Television taping, maybe. Yeah. Do you, do you remember that, the match? I mean, I remember that match real well. Yeah, yeah, because it did a great television rating, and um, it was the match that wake, uh, opened a lot of eyes about Brian Pillman. That may have been that may have been the best match ever to air at six on the six hundred five time slot. Well, that's saying a lot because you know you know back in um, I saw I saw I saw in the late seventies and early eighties I saw a lot of awfully good matches on that uh, show. I mean. You know, Ric Flair had matches with, like, you know, Magnum T.A. and Ronnie Garvin and probably Ricky Morton and all those guys in the glory days. You know, and that's when, you know, geez, those matches were just were just super matches. Yeah, the, on, on that tape, they have that Steamboat Flair match from the Saturday night. It was like a month after that uh, pay-per-view where they had the double pin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they, they had, like, the 40-minute match. Well, did you ever see the one with them? It was Steamboat and... um. Eddie Gilbert maybe against Flair. Yeah, yeah. Wyndham. They, didn't they hype up like a mystery partner like that whole? Right, show? mystery partner and Steamboat came in. That's when Steamboat came in to win the title from Flair. Yeah, that whole, that whole thing. It's all that, that was like January '89, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was actually, it was actually real bizarre. I remember watching like during that feud, Flair was supposed to be the heel, but Steamboat was just getting booed out of the building. Nah, it was fifty-fifty. You know, I mean, it, it was. I mean, I remember being. I mean, I remember in Chicago when they had the first big match, and I think that one was probably 60-40 Flair. Well, yeah, but when Steamboat, I go back, Steamboat, when I watch those interviews that Steamboat give. I don't know. He comes kind of comes off like a heel right now when I watch him. Well, today's standards. You know, it was like that. That the the, the trends were changing. You know, the Rick. You know, Rick Martel is very similar to Rick Steamboat. You know, kind of good looking, good physique, good athletic thing. Did Rick Martel ever wrestle? Did Rick, did you ever wrestle Steamboat? Did you ever get? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Did he say? Has he? No, no, he never did. He never did. That'd be a pretty good match. You know, it would have been a really good match. Yeah, good, real. Yeah. 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 Yeah, would have been enjoyed, uh, where it was like, yeah, I think it was in 1984. It was like an AWA versus NWA title match. What the, the flare? The flare Rick Martel match from Tokyo? Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about that match earlier. Yeah. Yeah, that was a super match, too. What about the Bob Backlund versus Ric Flair match? I think that was, like, in 1982. Yeah, I never saw it, but I heard it wasn't um, I heard it wasn't that great. But that was 82. I mean, you know, nobody had VCR. You know, they didn't videotape matches. Nobody knew these matches would be worth money, you know, 20 years later. What was your, what was your opinion of the uh, Bob Backlund-Bret Hart matches? I remember, um, they, I remember they had one on WWF Superstars that, was, that Bret just did, an, like, an awesome performance. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember the one where where they had the chicken wing forever, and then I remember they had a, I think it was a, a WrestleMania match years later that was like not good. <laughs> that match was horrible. I'm talking about like the one. This is the original match for Backlund turned heel. Um, I don't. You know, I just don't remember the. I I remember I remember seeing one Bret Hart Bob Backlund match when I thought that you know it wouldn't be good and it was like great. So that might be the one you're talking about. But yeah, it's that, just, that was that, that was a terrific match. Yeah. yeah, like that. I don't think that. I don't. That angle really didn't draw, but that was one of my favorite angles ever. Like the good Bob, guy goes Bob, back, Bob Backlund is a heel. He was very yeah. entertaining. Yeah. What about Bob Backlund runs for president? Oh, that was really entertaining. <laughs> I mean, I liked um, when they sent Bob Backlund on spring break. You know, when he was yelling at everyone for like, you know, like being in the sun and 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 you know all the teenagers on spring break. I mean, I just thought that stuff was just hilarious. Well, hey, where's Hakushi? Because like, whenever I watch some of his matches. Like they're pretty awesome. He's uh, wrestling for Michinoku Pro as Jinsei Shinzaki, you know, regular. Yeah, like like I was watching some of his matches against like the one two three kid. Uh, yeah, he had a good match with Bret Hart. He had a great match on Raw with Bret Hart. That was one of the better Raw matches too. Did they wrestle it in In Your House also? 
Uh, I believe so. I know. I'm sure they did because they had like kind of a program. Because remember, he did the moonsault um, off the. Remember that uh, period like, where they like, I mean, totally pushed Diesel and they like made Bret Hart a mid carter. Um. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's when that was. Yeah. <laughs> the influence of the click. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Dave, we've got to get running. Okay. 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 We'll talk to you later. All right. All right. Let's head to San Francisco and Matt. Matt, you're up with Rick Martell. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I have some fond memories, and I'm pretty sure you do too, Dave, of uh, 84 San Francisco AWA days with uh, Martell holding the title. Uh, I remember I remember a couple of Martell, uh, Nick Bockwinkel matches in San Francisco, maybe in Oakland. Stuff. I don't remember. I, mean, I remember one of the Cow Pals very, very distinctly because... Uh, I think that the ring collapsed either before. It wasn't in his match. It was the match before or after, when when I think Mass Superstar and and Greg Gagne and some other guys were in the ring. But I just remember that Bockwinkel and Rick had wrestled. I think it was like 35, 40 minutes. It was a long, long match. At the Cal, I, I know it was the Cow Palace because I can. I'm sorry. I'm starting to remember it now. Dave, do you remember? I don't know if you remember, but uh, 84. I can't remember what month or or whatnot. They had a an AWA show there with a tag team battle royal. Uh, and the, the main event after the battle royal was uh, supposed to be Brody and Blackwell. And Brody wasn't there? Oh, Brody was there. Oh, okay, so I do remember the show. Okay, I, then I was at the show because I remember Brody and Blackwell doing a big brawl at the Cow Palace. Yeah, that was a great, great match. Didn't Martell, Rick, didn't you work that show? No, it was a uh, tag team. Uh, I wasn't on there. No. Jeez. Yeah, that no, was... No. Did you, Rick, Rick, do you remember, was, God, it must have been, I'm trying to remember, would you, you and Tito Santana wrestled Gagne and Brunzel in a couple of matches back right, early yeah. days, before, before you had to run in the WWF? Yeah, as well as uh, Dino and I against uh, Greg and the gym. Brunzel. Yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. Dino, Dino was in, was uh, working the AWA for a little bit. Right. I remember that. They, they had him on TV, I think, for two weeks or something. I, I remember the, I remember the run with you guys. Jeez, well that that was back in the day, fabulous yeah. ones, of the Road Warriors. Boy, was little, that, yeah, I, I was a kid then, yeah. and you know that was my my first taste of live wrestling. Oh, going to Cow Palace? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know you walk in the building at that time, and you know you you could feel you know the history in that building. You know, un unlike today, you, know, you walk in the Cow Palace, it's the same old. You know. Well, the, I, I, I think you know. The, the, I think every arena had its own little. I know, Rick. When when you wrestled, like, because this is the, the territorial area. When you would wrestle, weren't there certain arenas that had different auras to you? You know, like. Whereas now, I think when you watch the TV, it sort of seems like any arena. They're not quite interchangeable because, like, the different cities have different crowds, but but they're more interchangeable than they were back back in say the 80s or something. Yeah, because I believe about all the uh, what's around the wrestling, you know, all the, the lighting and all the, you know, the entertainment around it. Back then, you know, was, you know, was down. Everything was to the basics, you know. So, of course, like the, the key auditorium in San Louis, uh, you had all the, the those different buildings, you know, the the uh, in Tampa, you know, the uh, auditorium there. The, the, is, you know, all those buildings had something, you know, that you walked in there and even. You know, not only you know uh, for the fans, but also you know, especially you know uh, for the wrestlers. You know, we'd go in there. I don't know the tradition that that was in those buildings. That you know, like the cow palace. You know, I mean, you'd go in there and and you walk in the ring and you know and you walk in that building and you you know there's just something about it that you wanted to perform to your best that day because you were there. You know, and you knew who were there before you and and the matches that took place there. Yes, it it did it have something. No, no, Rick, cause we, got, we had a hit break right now, but I want to ask you, um, were you a big fan, like, growing up as a kid, or was it more like, you know, your brother did it and then you kind of fell in? It was your older brother who did it, right, and then you got into right. it? Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I, you know, I got to be, um, I was about 10 years old when my brother started, you know, and, and instantly, uh, you know, he brought me with him to the matches, I, uh, and I was, uh, you know, a big fan uh, right off the bat. I mean, uh, right away I enjoyed it. Uh, I loved it, uh, you know, but I... Uh, but as a kid, uh, b beforehand, you know, uh, I remember watching matches, and uh, I always uh, was, you know, uh, thrilled to watch wrestling.
Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia, brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly by email to Dave Meltzer at yada.com will win a poster of a WF Superstar, courtesy of RC Edge. And remember to include your mailing address with your answer. Also, if you've won anything from Yada in the past 60 days, you are not eligible to win. Here's today's question. Name two full-time WWF performers from the past five years who actually played in an NFL regular season game. That doesn't mean they were on the team and didn't play. They had to actually play in a game, which actually uh, what's actually makes the question a little bit harder. Anyway, uh, we're here with uh, Rick Martell. We have a lot of emails here for Rick. Before we get to the uh, emails and everything, also you can call in at 1-877-392-3200. Um, what was your favorite territory to work of all the places that you went to? Uh, definitely, uh, uh, there was two, uh, you know, like WBF, you know, back uh, with Vince Senior, you know, was uh, really enjoyable. I mean, uh, I enjoyed that because the atmosphere that was there, you know, was like camaraderie and, you know, and of course Vince Senior was, uh, you know, what a great uh, promoter and a great guy to work for. And also, of course, I enjoyed Hawaii because, of, you know, it's like vacation there, you know, it's a great place, you know, beautiful place, but those were my two favorites. Do you have a place, uh, um, a place where you feel like you went, where you, because of the whatever, whether it was the atmosphere, the fans, or whatever, or just because you worked so many nights that you felt you improved your game the most in, or 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 you know like learned the most, you know like territory you're really glad you went to because, you know you it it, it helped you establish your career if you know what I mean learn a lot. Oh yes, uh, right, uh, New Zealand, you know, because yeah. of course I was around Mark Lewin and King Curtis and. Uh, you know, I was there for 10 months with those guys and learned about, you know, about the business, about interviews, about everything, you know, about angles, everything with those two guys. And uh, it was great. You know, that's really where I, you know, I learned the most, where it made me, uh, you know, uh, change uh, a, lot of, a lot of my style, a lot of my stuff. Um, what, what was the origination of the, uh, the model gimmick? You know, you just they, you were in WWF for a while. I think you did yeah. the break, and then you then they came back with the vignettes, and they did the thing with the tennis right. outfit, and yeah. Okay, well, uh, you know, it's like I said earlier. I, you know, I want to be here. Uh, then finally, when we, you know, Vince finally said, okay, okay, we'll give it a try, and you know, now, uh, you know, now I'm going to be a heel, but now I didn't know what kind of gimmick, right? So uh, JJ Dillon came up with that, the model, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, because I always like to dress nice, you know, and he said, hey, you know, it could be called a model, you know, and. And then I remember Vince telling me that, I'm going, oh, man, I said, you know, what am I going to do with that, you know? And then finally, uh, you know, my wife said to me, he says, well, be thankful they didn't call you a rooster, you know? Said, yeah, you're right, you got a point there. <laughs> so I, I started, and I'll tell you, um, I, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm the one that developed the character, you know, about the the, the runaway stuff, all the interviews, uh, the whole creating, uh, the, you know, I created the, the model, I mean, from A to Z, you know, I mean, the, uh, and what, uh, you remember what uh, Lord Hayes would say when I would go on the runaway and stuff, I would be the one that, that gave him the, the the material, you know, and and I I thought about that character. I mean, I I love that character. I loved it. I love doing it, and I, I'm, you know, I'm was I'm glad that the fans enjoyed it as much as I did. What was your thoughts? I guess it's about eighty-seven ish. Uh, you were, I guess, probably on en route to a WF tag team title with Tom Zink, and and he left. Uh, what you know exactly what happened? Because there were a million stories that came out of that, which. Okay. Well, I'm, some, well, some, were, some were not true, you know. Yeah, well, I tell you what happened is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we had, uh, you know, Vince loved it. Uh, he, he loved that gimmick, you know, Can Am, and, and we really got over it really fast and quick, and, and fans really uh, loved it. And, and uh, you know, we could feel that he was going somewhere. I mean, he, I mean, Dave was like almost overnight, you know, we, we, done, we, we did like a couple of TVs, you know, and then the first time we hit the road, you know, live shows, I mean, you could feel it, you know, they were going places. And, and what happened is that Tom, Tom, you know, had a, uh, you know, a, a Tom Zang just couldn't handle success, you know. He just, uh, he had a history of quitting when things, you know, were great. And, and uh, you know, we were going there, we were making tremendous money. I mean, uh, we were, and we were just starting, you know, I mean, we, we were going, you know, to make a lot more. 
And all of a sudden, his attitude started, you know, starting to get a big head, you know, and started. And I'm the one, like, after the matches, I, I was the one giving him pep talks, you know, where he could have been the other way around. I'm, I'm the uh, the veteran. He should be the one excited and say, oh, Ray, this is great. You know, we're doing fantastic, and look where we're going. And it was the other way around, you know, and he started getting a big head. And, and all of a sudden, I remember they, they, um, they had a memo saying that we couldn't wear jeans, you know, in WEF, uh, you know, in 87. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I remember one day, you know, we, we showed up at the match, uh, at the building with jeans, you know, and he's putting our team, you know, on set. So I went to him and said, look, uh, what are you doing this for? You know I mean? Oh, man, and then with those rules, you know, he started, you know, instead of being thankful for the big break he had, because he was making 50, you know, a year before that, he was making 50 bucks a night in Portland, you know. Oregon now he's making thousands of dollars a, a week, you know, and and uh, I'm saying, oh, what an ungrateful. And and I remember we had an argument, you know, that night. You know, I'm saying, look, I know what's wrong. What's wrong is your attitude, you know. I says, I don't know who you think you're becoming or you know who you think you are, you know. I says, here we are, the, you know, we have the biggest break, you know, that uh, people can hope for, and and you know, you, you think you're, you know, you're you God's uh, answer to wrestling, you know. I mean, so uh, the next morning. Morning, I got up. We we're supposed to go to interviews. There was a little piece of paper with the, the keys of the rental car, saying, "Rick, uh, thanks uh, for the break, uh, but uh, you know um, it's finished." And, uh, and that was it. Is there um, is there like any story behind you know you uh, lost the title, Stan Hansen? Was it just simply, you know, that they they came to you and said this is the time, or was there more no. to it than that? In fact, I'm the one that suggested it, that, that I lose the title, uh, you know, because I was, uh, I wanted to uh, buy, I bought in a third of the promotion in Montreal, and uh, I remember, you know, uh, I could feel that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I wasn't, you know, Vern, the way he would say, you know, see things and the way I would see things when we didn't agree much, and uh, so finally I could feel it was coming on, you know, I says, well, before it does, I, I suggested I suggested Stan, you know, uh, because I'd wrestled Stan many times. In fact, we wrestled together. We started uh, almost in Texas. We had some good, really good matches, Stan and I, in '75. And and I, you know, he's a good friend of mine. And I said, well, and you know, Stan being uh, the hot star in Japan, he was right away. Vern thought it was a great idea, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we went uh, with it and. Uh, uh, and as it turned out, <laughs> Vern wasn't so, such a good thing for Vern. <laughs> um, this is from Oliver Postlewaite from Ottawa, who says, I grew up watching Rick in international wrestling, and I used to see him live at the Robert Guertin Arena in Hall. I have so many memories from that time, but the strongest is an angle that you did where you smashed a beer bottle over your head and bled like crazy. I think it was in a feud with Steve Strong. Do you and he goes, do you remember this, and what were your thoughts about international wrestling during that period of time? Yes, uh, well, uh, you know, I remember that night very well, uh, you know, the bottle and everything, and uh, it, uh, it had a great impact, you know, I mean, people couldn't believe I, uh, you know, I did it. I'd seen uh, the Beast uh, done at the Rudy Case brother, and uh, I'd seen him do that in Hawaii. In fact, I was in a cage match against him in Hawaii, and for that interview, he did it, you know, with a the beer bottle burn in the blood, and I'm going, wow, this is great, you know. And I remember being in that match against Steve Strong, and Steve Strong was such a strong character, and and I mean, uh, you know, and I needed to put some spice into it and make, you know, really like uh, things were going to happen in that cage match. I said, well, let's let's go have that beer bottle. I'm going to do it. And people went, are you crazy? Are you nuts or what? You know, and I did it, and, uh, you know, we put it in slow motion on TV and it looked fantastic, you know. Now, um, did you ever do that in Portland? Because I seem to remember, and I don't know if it was uh, you. Roddy Piper did it in Portland. Okay, and you were Roddy Piper's tag team partner then, right? Right, and I remember okay. before the night before Roddy did it on Saturday, uh, because he was with me in Hawaii when we both saw it at the same time when the, the Beast did it. And I remember him and I, the night before, we were at, uh, at the, uh, outside our motel, you know, our hotel rooms, motel room, and we both in front of the, uh, our yard, you know, <laughs> with a beer bottle in each hand, you know, we said, well, we got to try this, and we both did it that night, you know. Uh, of course, uh, 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 with a couple of beers inside. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, and then the next night, uh, Roddy did it on the Portland TV. 
Let's go to James in New Jersey. James, you're up with Rick Martell. Is this Rick Martell? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry, I just tuned in late. At least there's one person out here worth respecting. Now, I have a question. Dave Melzer, how long did it take to wipe the brown off your nose at the last Thursday at the Pillman Show? Because you were uh, brown, you're such a brown nose with his WWF marks. Uh, that's, that's really intelligent. See you later. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, let's see where, where where were we? Um, da, 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 da. This is from Scott in Maine, who was uh, asking, uh, "How would you compare working to the AWA and working to the working in the WWF in the 80s? Oh, wait, wait, before I get to that, as far as the international wrestling goes, um, now you were you said that you were like a one third owner at one point. What what happened there? Like, did you get out and then go to WWF or? Yes, uh, exactly. You see. Uh, we're doing great. We had, uh, you know, some really good uh, crowds, and uh, you know, business was great. But we had, the, we getting pressured by the television uh, because see, Vince uh, by then was uh, kind of taking over wrestling, as you know, uh, you know, with sending his tapes uh, free, you know, and with uh, better quality than our tapes, of course. And so our the manager, the TV station manager, were pressuring us every week. Well, you got to invest more in your television, you know, and look at these guys, and we could have it stay for free, and look at you guys. And so I could feel, I could see what was coming on. So I said, well, the, before the the, the shift started to sink, you know, I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out here, you know. So I went and had a meet a secret meeting with Vince, uh, with nobody knew it. Uh, had a secret meeting with Vince, and uh, then I came up. Vince wanted me as a single, and I came up with the idea with Can Am connection. You know, I said, "Look, I got this kid. He never saw Tom Zink in his life. He didn't even know who he was. You know, never heard from him." And I said, "Look, I'm sure it's gonna work. Look, this how and this and that." And and uh, he said, "Okay, Rick, I'm gonna take your word for it, and we're gonna go with this idea of yours." And uh, and he did, and the idea worked, but it's just the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, as far as like afterwards. Uh, with with Santana, you guys uh, worked a lot with what Hart Foundation, Demolition, the yeah. various teams that were in the WWF at that time. Is there, is there anyone from I mean, I, I, in, in any period in your time in your career where you really didn't like working with them, where it was just sort of like you went into where they were in your territory or something, and it was one of those things where you kind of rolled your eyes and go, oh boy, you know, this was you know, well, this won't be a fun night. Yeah. Uh... Well, in fact, uh, I tell you that when I first went into WBF, you know, uh, back in the days of uh, Vince Senior, you know, um, you know, I came, you know, from uh, uh, the South, you know, or Georgia and Florida and Texas and you know all these places, and I and I came, you know, from uh, Portland, you know, where he had a great crew, you know, Buddy Rose and uh, you know Roddy and them, and then here I am, you know, I mean, uh, 25 or something, you know, wanted to get over like you know gangbusters in, in WBF, you know, New York City, the big town, you know, and I go there and I remember my first night in, you know, I'm working against Baron Cicluna. <laughs> And, oh, man, I, you know, Baron didn't want to do anything, and, I, you know, I wanted to jump all over, you know what I mean? And uh, so it was hard to get adjusted to that type of thing, you know, and I remember Giant, you know, came to me and said, don't worry, you know, look, this is how it works here, and, you know, take your time, and, you know, eventually you'll get who you want to work with. And so uh, I was patient, and things paid off. But uh, yeah. those, those, yeah, those, those were hard nights, you know, for me to get go through when you first went to WWF, it was not. Um, there weren't a lot of really, I, I'd say, athletic style wrestlers. You know, kind of your style was more of a real big, slow guy territory. Right, exactly. You know, that, that that's what I mean. I mean, like a really slow type thing, and uh, no, not much. You know, spots and stuff, and uh, you know, was, and then of course, you know, you had Don Rocco was just, you know, and uh, you know, with the Intercontinental title, you know, and. And man, when I could, you know, work with Don, it was great. You know, we enjoy that. But other than, you know, and slowly it turned around. You know, things. Uh... Do you have any, Do you have like a, of all the the various tag partners that you had over the years? Do you got like a a favorite one? Was it, was it Tito or somebody else? Yeah. Um, well, of course. Uh, you, you know, uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, with Tony Gurria, uh as uh, as much inside as outside, you know, uh, you know, and in, in, in we're two times a tag team title holder, and I enjoyed that. Uh, uh, but also, you know, Tito was a great partner. Uh, but I'll tell you, of all those things, of all those guys that I, you know, was partner with, Tony Rich, you know, and uh, we had a great uh, run in Georgia. 
together. Uh, but all those guys, I tell you, if the Canon connection would have stayed the course, you know, and I mean, uh, Tom Zink and I, uh, you know, we could have got over. Uh, I mean, that that Canon connection to me was, I felt, uh, would have been the best thing uh, I could have done. You can buy the Logitech. Logitech QuickCam Express for just under $50. Check out QuickCam.com. But you can win one right here. Now, this is one where you got to call up uh, to give us the answer, and you'll get a webcam. Uh, it's not an email one. So, anyway, here is the question. It involves Rick Martell. And Rick Martell, just a few minutes ago, had mentioned his tag team with Tony Gurria. Who, when Rick Martell and Tony Gurria were in the WF, they held the WF tag team titles a couple of times. Who did they win the championships from? So anyway, you got to have all of the teams they beat to win the titles. Uh, and that's our trivia question. So we'll start taking answers to that in just a second. Uh, before we get some callers on that, I want to ask Rick. We've got a, several emails about your match with Jake Roberts uh, in the blindfold match. And uh, were you really blind? And what was it like working out that match? Yeah, well, it wasn't, uh, you know, we could see a little bit, uh, not much. It was hard. Uh, in fact, uh, the first night that we tried this, I never had a blindfold match before that. So uh, we had a, a trial match in uh, West Palm Beach, uh, Florida. And uh, I remember, you know, I, I put this thing in, on my head. And I, you know, it was hard to see, but... Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, Jake was such a great worker, and, and uh, he had done those matches before, and he let me throw it. The things are, you know, really good. It really, uh, it really clicked. Okay. We've got uh, Dave from San Francisco. You're first up trying to win the cam. Yeah, I got the answer to your question. You probably do. Okay. <laughs> they won them from the Samoans. They lost mm -hmm. them to the Moondogs. Then they... Won them from the Moondogs, then they lost them to Fuji and Saido. That's correct. Got it. That's Thanks, it. Guys. Okay, gotta hang on and uh, get the uh, give your address. Okay, let's see. Uh, we were talking about that uh, that blindfold match. Um, now, did you? I'm trying to remember. Was Jake? Did Jake disappear right after that, or did you? Because I seem to remember the blindfold match and somebody disappeared. I did. That match. I did. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That's, no, no, you was, was that like kind of your your um. Like if you had given notice and you were going to drop that match and then get out, was that yeah, kind of the correct. idea? Yeah. Okay. What? What? At that point in time, so this is ninety ninety one. Is that right? Ninety one. Yeah. Okay. What was the mentality of? Uh, see, so you would have been uh, how old? Like mid thirties by this at this point? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, see, I was a uh, I was getting involved with commercial real estate at that time. Now I I knew wrestling was meant to be. I didn't want to finish up. See, I, all those years, Dave, I I seen so many wrestlers, you know, especially back then, you know, where, you know, uh, you know, didn't have another life after wrestling, and they hang on and hang on and hang on, and and then they just, uh, you know, I, I didn't want that to happen to me. You know, I said I'm gonna get ready, and and so in '91, right after that match, I got involved in commercial real estate and. I started, uh, you know, uh, in that business, and uh, and then I came back uh, a couple of years after, in 93. Now, when you left in 91, um, physically, um, were, 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 was, were, you, were you banged up, or were you feeling pretty darn good leaving? I was, I was feeling good. Oh, yeah, I was feeling really good. Uh, physically, I was feeling good. It was mentally that, uh, you know, it was hard. Uh, you know, wrestling was hard business, and, and uh, you know, you have to, to remember that, uh, you know, I started, you know, I'd been in 91, I'd already been in, in wrestling, you know, for 18 years, you know, so I didn't want to do that much longer, you know. I said, uh, so uh, physically, you know, it was, it was great, uh, but mentally it was the hardest, you know. Now, when you were when you were when you were in in wrestling, um, as far as uh, the training and things like that, um, did you train differently than the other guys? Because um, I mean, like it, it, as as years went on, the good physique was not unusual. When you started, uh, I don't even say there were there were wrestlers with good physiques, but I mean, you had that like that very very athletic look. You know, not a you know, it wasn't like a, it was like a bodybuilder, but not a a huge bodybuilder that didn't have mobility. It was, you know, because you had the quickness and everything to go with it. So it was kind of that kind of athletic, you know, track star type of, you know, yeah. but, but bigger than a track star. You know, but you know what I'm saying? That look, is it, uh, did you train differently than people was, than other people? Or was it a kind of a look that you just were genetically programmed for? Or had it, had that all, or was, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I, maybe uh, genetically, uh, you know, it was uh, like that. But my training and my dieting, uh, you know, 
uh, was, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, that Tom Zank uh, really helped me with that. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, the, the nutrition, I didn't pay much attention to that. Uh, you know, I said, I thought, you know, well, I go and, you know, work out for two and a half hours and then, you know, the meals, I had all kinds of, you know, too much protein and uh, I didn't pay attention. Well, Tom Zank uh, taught me about, you know, you should have, you know, so much carbs and so much protein and, and uh, everything. And, I mean, I really learned a lot from him uh, on that uh, as far as uh, training you know he was a bodybuilder before uh, I met him and and I learned a lot from him and uh, I and uh, you know discipline I've always been very disciplined you know and and whether you know I'd be on the road or whether in Europe or wherever I always you know uh, diet and and went to the gym and stuff uh, let's go to Masad in Pennsylvania Masad, what's going on hey Dave Rick hi how are both of you thanks um, Dave, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, seeing uh, as, uh, as if uh, all Japan might split up, if uh, do you think all the wrestlers would go would go with uh, Misawa? And if they did, would Misawa be open minded about them coming to the U.S. or not? That's so. It's too early to tell. I, I don't. You know, a lot of people thought that that was going to happen within the next couple of weeks at the end of this tour, and my. The impression I get is that it's is that because of um, kind of like uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but respect for Jumbo Saruta, that it may not happen so shortly because now everyone's going like you know if if we all leave and this company dies, it's like the history of Baba and Saruta you know kind of dies with the company. So there's somewhat of an aversion that the timing isn't right to make the move. Um, if it does, I I don't know what Misawa's thought is because you know you know. Misawa was like, you know, there's, there's two types of Japanese wrestlers. Well, there's many different types, but but, what I'm, but but you've got your Japanese wrestlers that, you know, at one point in their career wrestled a lot in the United States, and you know, kind of have, you know, kind of understand American wrestling and the American thing. And then you get the Japanese wrestlers like Misawa, who really never, I mean, he he had wrestled matches in the United States, but never wrestled regularly in the United States, and. So I don't know, you know, where his mentality is. You know, his style of wrestling is is not American. Or it's very different from what they do in the United States now, and the All Japan style is, you know, totally different than American style right now. So maybe I don't I don't know what his mentality would just be like, you know, hey, you know, it's not even similar. Whereas like in the in the 80s, it was different style, but you know, if a guy was great in the United States and went to Japan, they usually could be great there or good there. And here it's like it's different animals. Like there's some of the greatest wrestlers here would probably go over there and not be good, and, and certainly vice versa. And um, my last question was, uh, if, if, let's just say he does decide that he might come or he might send someone. Who do you think is the American wrestler that would uh, blend with them the best? With, with For All Japan? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, that's so, that's really hard because it's like, the way their their stuff is, it's like you know the kind of guys who got over there in the past where you're like your Stan Hansen, Terry, I mean Steve Williams, Stan Hansen, Terry Gordy, Bruiser Brody. So you're talking about you know good sized guys with agility and a lot of athletic ability, um, you know. But they they, they kind of like that big look. So you know kind of like um you know like I think you know Rock, it's a different style and he throws a lot of punches. And it's 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 hard if he could. Do the forearms instead of the punches because he's got you know he's agile and big. Um, at the same time, I could see, I could see him. I don't know. Is there anyone you could think of offhand? I mean, I myself. Um, so, uh, either either of you. Uh, as far as like a wrestler of today who would like fit in with like the all Japan style of you know American form you know forearms. Uh, Booker T. Form. Maybe Booker T. If he's yeah, given Booker the Booker T. Does all those great moves that you know leg. Uh, you know, I think it would. You know, it looks great. Uh, you know, I think it would do great there. Mm -hmm. Myself, I, I think uh, Triple H has proven he can he can fight any style. It's a different style. He's a great worker. I think it's a different. I think that's a different style of work. But I mean, he, and that's not saying he couldn't go there and adapt and be real good at it. Um, and also, the thing is with Triple H is he's, he's pretty good at working the crowd, and that that's. That's probably something that they need a little bit of. Um, it, it, it'd be interesting. Like a guy like Van Dam, I would say, to be a top guy there, no, it's the style doesn't work as a, as a top guy main event style. 
Um, even though Van Damme's been there, you know, Van Damme style is more of a, a mid card all Japan. You know, when he was there. Um, I'm just trying to think who the other. You know, so, so many of the best young guys here. I'm trying to think of who who. Um, I don't know. No one's really popping into my head right now. Um, as far as uh, Angle, to me, Angle's more New Japan style than All Japan. Uh, I, I think you know, Angle would do very well there if he got the if he got the opportunity. I think though. I mean, as far as like. Um, you know, Angle would, Angle would, I think, would do real, real well in that tag team role. Of course, Benoit would do, if, if he went, Benoit would do tremendous there, because he knows what to do there. Um, I don't know. He's already Anybody been have, tremendous. Any... What? He's already been tremendous in Japan. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was with New Japan. He's, you know, Benoit's never gone all Japan. Yeah. And he, there are differences. But, you know, he, he would do, he would do great, you know, obviously, because, and they, and he would get over great because the Japanese kind of think of him as almost one of them anyway. Because they know that he trained, you know, he started his training there, and his early career was there. All right, I know you guys gotta go. I'll, All right. I'll... Okay, I'll talk to you later. Uh, let's see what else we got going. Um, so we're gonna, you know, um, as far as, uh, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the other charities? Did you ever work Carolinas? No, you know, I never did. Uh, uh, I never. You know, I mean, a lot of people ask, you know, because I was there, you know, in, you know, Georgia and Florida, Texas, and, and um, you know, when I was about to go to Carolina, that's when I got, uh, uh, because that was going to be my next move after Georgia, you know, to go to Carolina. I would met, you know, Rick uh, Flair, and, and everybody was saying, Rick, you know, you should come there, and you should go. And and uh, then I met uh, Mark Lewin, who said, uh, you know, he told me about Australia and New Zealand, and I, I, I knew I needed uh, to get away from the States and make a break and then come back later, you know, get a couple of years of experience before I came back to the States. And so I, uh, so I didn't get a chance to go to Carolina. Do you ever wrestle like uh, one of the European circuits, like uh, England circuit or or like Autobahn circuit or anything like that? Yeah, I wrestled for Otto. Uh, went to Austria, um, you know, and, and Germany for Otto uh, because you know I, I met Otto back in the AWA, you know, and and we traveled together a couple of times, and uh, so I uh, he told me uh, when I was at uh, WBF, and I told him I said, look. Uh, you know, when I'm finished here, definitely I'll come. You know, I'll come for you and for a couple of tours. You know, and I did. Is there is there any? Um, I mean, like a lot of wrestlers, you know, stayed in the states, and then you know, you pretty much went everywhere. Was it just the opportunity called, or did you have when you started in wrestling uh, the idea that you know one of the perks of wrestling was that you were going to get to travel the world? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, see. Um, when I started, uh, I wanted to learn, you know, as much as I could, a different style and, and see as many different wrestlers uh, uh, from all over the world, you know. And I said the only way possible was to go travel, you know, and, and see, uh, you know, in fact, when I went to New Zealand, uh, you know, that's when I, you know, I started, I went to Singapore and all those places, and I, I met all these different guys, and, uh, you know, to me it was uh, the best way to learn, I mean, uh, the different style, different uh, wrestling, and, and uh, I'm glad I did. Um, is there any place that you went that you hated, or said, like, you went on, like, one trip to, um, and just said, man, this, this, this part of the world I'm never going back to? <laughs> Yeah, uh, South America, I went to, um, you know, uh, Caracas, you know, and, uh, oh, man, it was rough. Uh, you know, we couldn't even get out of the, you know, at night, you can, you know, they said you couldn't get out of the hotel, you know, I mean, because you'd be dangerous, you know, and uh, I didn't like those kind of places. And, and, you know, I was offered a lot of tours uh, when I was off in 91, and, and uh, again, when I took off in 94, I was offered a lot of tours in India and uh, South Africa and all those places. And in fact, you know that tour where that you know Chris uh, got injured. Uh, you remember that uh, the, the kid from Georgia got injured and uh, they had a, a riot and he got really badly injured. Uh, uh, Is it in India? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they write it because uh, Chris Walker, right? Yeah, Chris Walker, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I was supposed to be, you know, they they asked me to go on that tour, you know. What I mean, and I didn't want to go to those places, uh, you know, where I didn't feel, you know, where your security was, you know, better. And I tell you, another place, uh, uh, especially back then, that I that I didn't care much for. Uh, 
I didn't re never wrestle in that territory for a long period of time. I just went and did a couple of shots that was in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, my brother died there, uh, you know. So I went back there when Frenchie Martin was there. Uh, you know, I wrestled with his brother. I went there for a couple, and and it's such a dangerous uh, place. I didn't uh, really enjoy that. Yeah, that was uh, you went to Puerto Rico. Was it that before or after what happened to Brody? Um, was it before? Okay, okay, yeah, because yeah, I went, well, before once, and and I went after a couple of years after I went once. Oh, just just for like one shot in and out. Yeah, yeah, I just I never wore that territory a long time. Yeah. Just I, I just went there for, uh, you know, uh, one shot or two. Now, uh, you worked for a long time for, you know, it was, it was over a year probably, maybe longer for Don Owen, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I went for Don about, yeah, about ten months around there. Yeah, that was just before I went to WBF. Was there any, any, we talked a little bit about it, you know, they had Buddy Rose and Roddy Piper and people like that, um, you know, and as I recall, I think Kurt Hennig might have been there too. They they had a lot of guys in that territory that went on, you know, to be great workers. Um, was it just as, as far as the Oregon? Is there anything about the Oregon territory that you felt just because I don't know? I, I guess there's a lot of uh, getting a lot of interview time, or that you worked long matches, you worked six nights a week, or whatever it was that uh, led to so many of the wrestlers developing well there. Yeah, that, and also uh, Don Owens, uh, uh, much to his credit, uh, was a great promoter. He, he gave a lot of leeway to the guys, you know. You could be creative, and you could, uh, you know, you didn't have a, a booker that would, you know, hold you down and uh, and have his little pick or whatever, you know. I mean, you could go there and be creative, and, and man, uh, Don was tremendous. Uh, he, he let you, he gave you your chance, you know, uh, give you a chance uh, to develop as a wrestler, and, uh, and uh, that's why a lot of guys that went there and all of a sudden, you know, blossom into uh, top workers, you know. When you were a kid, you mentioned you started watching wrestling at the age of 10. Uh, was, was it Montreal wrestling? Right. Yeah. Is there any, anyone, um, anyone in particular as far as like a, a favorite wrestler? Oh, of up? course, uh, you know, my dog was Sean here in, in uh, Quebec, you know, is, uh, you know, our big idol here, you know. And, uh, and also, yeah, you know, uh, Johnny Rougeau, who was uh, the promoter, and, and he also worked, uh, you know, he was a big star here, and Carpentier, you know. So those were the big uh, big stars here. Okay, Rick, we are totally out of time right now. I want to thank you very much for doing the show, and uh, we'll try to do this again. And uh, best of luck, and uh, hope you have a, a, reti a good retirement, and you're not lured back because you need <laughs> the guys... <laughs> you need the guys get lured back and then kind of it's then kind of feel weird about it. Well, no, you can take my word for it, uh, David. I'm not getting back. I have no intention of doing so, and I'm I'm enjoying my life too much uh, for that right now. And uh, and also, you know, I want to take the opportunity, you know, to thank all the all the the fans, you know, in the states and now all over, you know, the world. Uh, you know, they were had some great times, and uh, you know, uh, also want to congratulate congratulate you uh, for your success. I remember uh, you, Dave, from years ago, you know, your first time, and, you know, I remember in the dress room, say, who's this guy, you know, what is this, you know, and the uh, newsletter, what, 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 <laughs> and, uh, you know, here you are now, you know, a uh, big success, and, uh, you know, it's great for you. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate that, and uh, good luck to you, and uh, don't forget, uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at 6.